Good morning, Andrew. Welcome to the Let's Talk Paralegal podcast. This is awesome. You're our first legal recruiter on the podcast. And it was my mission that for season two, I would have a legal recruiter on the podcast because I can't tell you how many times I've had my listeners and my viewers and my followers you know, request this because it's something um, like we were talking about a little bit that a lot of people are unfamiliar with. It's like untouched territory and they have a lot of questions. So hopefully we can answer some of those questions, right? Because we have limited time, but um, hopefully we can answer the bulk of those questions uh, throughout our conversation this morning, right? Absolutely. And thank you so much, Ada, for having me. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Uh, value provide to your listeners. I, uh, I trust I'll be able to throw some insights and uh, wisdom on top of that. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. So let's just dive right in because I love these topics that you chose to speak about today. Um, and the first one you had spoken about with me is specific experiences, right? Because we all know it's very individual sometimes, but we, you know, there's always a pattern, right? So talk about those experiences. Sure. So taking a step back, my team and I uh, were a company called Palmer Kent Associates. We're located in Boca Raton, Florida. And the majority of the placements and the candidates we work with, the placements we make, are within big law. Law 100 specifically, and it extends to the Amlaw 200 with some smaller mid-sized firms and boutiques uh, spread throughout. And we, um, we work nationwide. So as far as specific experiences, a lot of what I've, I've found and a lot of what these firms are looking for in this very strong kind of bounce back market from the freeze that COVID brought is they're looking for great credentials, they're looking for great experience, and they're looking for individuals specific to COVID. How have you overcome the, the difference in workflow that COVID brought to the whole law firm um, dynamic, the whole environment? So some things have changed and specific experiences are like, how interviews have moved to a, a Zoom uh, format and what that means for candidates who were so used to in years past going into a law firm, being able to speak and connect with someone face to face. So that's changed just a bit, but the, um, the substantive matters of interviews are much the same, just a, a couple differences. And so, so it sounds uh, to me it's more like versatility and resilience is really what they're looking for, right? And I think those are two things that as legal professionals, we all need to carry on, you know what I mean? Um, Because our caseloads are different and diverse and uh, we need to handle clients. So that's something that every legal professional should have, hopefully. I mean, I'm just saying, generalizing this at this moment. Um, Any tips that you have for those particular people that may not be very keen on change and and really struggled, like how to overcome those or, or, you know, anything that you can provide to them would be nice. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you spoke to a great quality, resilience, and that's what we speak to a lot of attorneys about, because despite what the challenges, um, despite the challenges that COVID and just the, the day-to-day of being an attorney have brought in general, um, it's resilience and it's tenacity, it's grit to get through it and figure out a system that works best for you. Um, I, I've spoken with attorneys that, like you might have read in some articles on how to kind of establish a nice workflow is separate work from from home, even though they're being done in the same place, Uh, being able to shut off uh, mentally. And I know that's a little more difficult for attorneys when there's deadlines that are constant and hours that extend past the normal working day, but it's just uh, figuring out what works best for you and and being able to reach out. One of the big things that I speak to many attorneys about is even though you're connected to a team often by, by a Zoom call versus being able to walk down a hallway, Uh, Use that to your advantage because you're still expected and it's still to your benefit to create relationships with your colleagues, with partners. I'm talking about associates, of course. And uh, I would encourage people not to use the fact that you you can't just walk down a hall or you can't just um, stop by a desk as as an excuse, but use the uh, the Zoom to continue to create and uh, and forge those relationships that are going to serve you in development, serve you when you need a helping hand serve you when you have a question on a, on, a, on a matter that you don't know how to do. So once again, um, I, I encourage everyone to be tough and not use the fact that you don't have your team right around you physically as an excuse. Do what you can. And, um, and that's how you're going to create success for yourself. Yeah, I think we talk about that a lot in the podcast in general. You know, we talk about how um, 
strategizing really, you know, instead of these, uh, I always, I'm a big advocate of these last minute meetings, uh, you know, don't do them, right? If you strategize and you organize your caseload and you organize the case from the beginning, it'll eliminate some of these last minute deadlines. And really all you'll have to worry about in the end are like these emergency motions or these emotion, you know, emergency hearings, which are true emergencies, right? Something else pops up or, or the attorney's unable to attend or there's a judge being, you know, removed from the case, you know, there's always going to be other outside elements that will affect your case. But I feel like when we do these meetings, like you said, on a day to day or just more constant and talk about strategy versus what's the next thing, you know, like what's next? I hate those, right? So um, I think they're very counterproductive what, versus if you sit down with your attorneys or your associates or anyone, you know, as a team and you strategize and you make a plan, you know, a discovery plan or um, strategize on how you're going to handle the case from beginning to end, um, you know, how to handle those emergencies. I think these, a lot of those things can be alleviated and those tips that you just provided about kind of signing off and, and you know, walking away without all that, like, weight on your shoulders, I think would be a lot easier if you just organized yourself a little more, right? Um, we talk a lot about time management on the podcast as well, but that's, you know, a topic for another day as well. Um, so how about some, like, resume, right? A lot of people, <laughs> I don't know, a, a lot of people, um, for me anyway, they they don't pay attention to their resume as much as they should. Um, you know, they say that the first, first impression is the resume, right? That's how they're really going to call you in. So talk a little bit about that and, and how to handle that situation. Absolutely. Kind of just um, an overall thought I have as you as you shared is um, your resume is what's going to speak about you on paper. And you won't have the opportunity at first to be able to speak on top of anything else besides what's literally on that page. So you really want to represent in a succinct, concise, but effective manner uh, what your experience has been and what the narrative of your professional career has been. Um, I say sometimes that there are things that mean a lot to a candidate that happened before law school, during law school, that um, don't have anything to do with the role they're going for, the opportunity. And while it's great to read about, understand that when there are a pair of eyes on a resume, you want them to touch on the main factors that are going to set your resume apart and not create questions, not create concerns, not create um, any doubt as to why they're a great candidate. So, um, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I think it, it should be utilized more as a, a summary of your experience and accomplishments, right? Um, a lot of people underutilize the resume option. And of course, we can go dive into like, you know, grammar and spelling. Duh, those are givens. But, um, you know, as far as what did you do to handle the caseload? You know, these are things that managers want to know about, you know, um, how, how many cases have you won with those strategies? You know, you got to give them useful information as well as well, I drafted, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, motions. Okay, that's great. But like, what did those motions, you know, get you the trial win or get you the settlement? You know, like, that's really what they want to know. Okay, great. You can file a, you know, you can draft a motion for summary judgment. Okay. I mean, I have five other candidates that can do that as well. Tell me what sets you apart from drafting and, you know, going into trial. How many trials have you attended? Right. Um, all that good stuff is really important. In yeah. That. yeah, to your point you just raised, being able to highlight whenever you've been given or you've taken on um, additional responsibility than just what your job stipulates, your role stipulates, mm. that's all I highlight like, because it shows leadership. It shows a lot of uh, intangible qualities that these uh, decision makers, these partners are born and associate as well. That's awesome. And I think you had a little bit more on like the how to's, right? So can you tell us about that? Absolutely. So when it comes to a resume, um, you want to be succinct. Uh, a lot of times the order does matter. If you went to a great law school and you're mm -hmm. still an associate, you want to put that education on top because you don't have as many years of experience. Um, but if you're maybe um, a more mid-level associate, you want to lead in with your experience. Uh, a, a quick kind of like facelift um, suggestion I make to a lot of attorneys is just the order of how you present information does matter. Wow. And how I like yeah, that. Yeah. Write that one down. Most definitely. Again, if you're a younger associate, education first. If you went to a great law school, you had a great GPA, 
Otherwise, you want to lead in with the experience um, that will contribute to them assessing how, how you've uh, progressed as an attorney in your first couple of years. So that's just now, a cool, yeah. This might be a personal opinion, but would you recommend it to be short and to the point or are you more of lengthy resumes or does it depend like everything else in law? I'd say it does depend on the experience specifically. Um, you can quickly tell when you look at a resume if their experience is limited. And so you wanna be able to highlight other pieces. Maybe they did really well in law school. They just found themselves in a position where they're not quite getting the work they want, or it's been a number of factors that have limited their experience that they hope. Mm -hmm. So it's all about how you can tailor your resume to play to your strengths and also get that window open so you can be sitting across the table from a decision maker and you're able to expound on what, uh, what that resume um, can't fully share. So it's all about highlight, making sure that resume is playing to your strengths and showcasing what you do bring to the table. And so when you have that opportunity to speak on further, you're able to take full advantage. I love it. I love it. That's amazing. How about cover letters? Any, any tips on cover letters? Are they useful? Are they not? Depends. With what I do specifically, um, I'm not often working with cover letters. Yes, they're important. Um, I've seen them. I, I enjoy reading them just because I'm, I'm passionate about communication overall. So whether that's spoken word, uh, writing, I, I take um, a lot of pride in working with candidates on, on beefing up those resumes, those cover letters. I always like to say concise, succinct, and really make it known why you're going to be a value add to this organization. People shy away from a resume or a cover letter being that boastful opportunity. It is absolutely a boastful opportunity. So you you showcase what you bring to the table and how you're going to be a value add from day one. Really toot your own horn in this case and make sure they know without a shadow of a doubt how you're going to be valuable to their team and their organization. And I think it goes to your point about if they lack that experience, bring in, you know, the cover letter is a great opportunity to bring in the other values that you can bring to the table, right? Absolutely. Um, I always use uh, Google as an example when I give it to my students, my paralegal students. Um, I use a cover letter, like if you were to apply for Google, right? Because they're like the biggest company like out there, right? So why not? <laughs> so I always use them as an example. And I'm a big advocate of Google for some reason. I have no idea why. I should get paid. Like they should be paying me at this point because I promote them so much. Um, sure. If you're hearing this, you know, sponsor. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I always use the sample cover letter that I provide them. Um, with that such a big organization, right? Because I always say aim high, you know, um, so you can either get there or surpass it. But, I, you know, in that in that cover letter, I kind of, you know, I'm on the same page with you as far as really highlighting what you have to offer. I think that that's a great opportunity um, to say why you want to be with that organization as well. You know, hey, I, I love your products. I actually use your products. You know, this is great. Um, you know, I know about your company. I've been following you for X amount of years. You know, when I was in your case, when I was in law school, you know, we had a couple of cases where you guys were involved and that really intrigued me. And, you know, just really highlight the why and and show the initiative because I feel like a lot of people forget that when you're going to work for a company you're going joining a family right these these attorneys are they own these companies whether they're huge little whatever it is but they built it from the ground up most of these companies have built it from the ground up or they're generational like the Morgan and Morgans of the world um sure but yet they're still family, you know? So if they're going to bring you into that family, you really have to show them, hey, I really want to work with you guys. This is why. This is what I have to offer. This is my value. Like really sell yourself. I feel like um, sometimes you want to make it more of a sales pitch versus an interview at that point. Um, really let them know and highlight your positives um, when it comes to that. Absolutely. So points that came up and what you just shared. So I, I, uh, I took the liberty of just writing down because I wanted to dive into a couple of them. Mm. Um, one of the things is when it comes to cover letters, again, taking a step back as to how this lateral process works when you work with a recruiter like myself. The reason I don't work with as many cover letters is because the way I'm communicating with the firm and the decision makers, I'm often taking pieces of a, call it a cover letter and sharing that with them directly. So I'm not working with a specific cover letter, though, you know, they request it. And what I always share, especially when an 
is looking to uh, switch practice areas, which is something we see quite often. Um, yes. Say one more time. No, yes, for sure. They, they want to change. Right. And it's, um, it's one of the biggest things I, I've seen be successful when it comes to what you put in a cover letter or what I'm sharing on behalf of a candidate is if you're in, say, litigation and you want to do business transactional work, what are the skill sets, soft and hard, that you received from your current role that are going to translate, once again, to be a value add from day one with that new firm? These are the kinds of things that might sound obvious when I say it, but when you're in the thick of it and wondering what the heck you're supposed to write about, these are some things that might escape your, your judgment and escape how you think about things. So that's definitely a how-to I'd highly recommend, is if you're switching practice areas or if you're going to either a larger firm or just a different firm than where you're currently at, it's how does your current experience translate to how you're going to be a value add on day one. With yeah, that. transferable skills for sure. And I always say that, especially for people that are starting at a lower level, you know, like a receptionist or intake person or someone at a lower level that are trying to reach that paralegal or executive assistant status. Um, transferable skills are amazing. You know, customer service is number one for law firms. Um, if you're in civil, uh, that's pretty much the same concept. So if you know how to, you know, if you're a civil litigator, it's going to translate, you know, throughout the entire thing, unless you're going to go into criminal. Well, that's a whole different monster, right? So you're going to have to find similarities as far as the civil and uh, criminal procedures go. But as long as you're familiar with civil procedures and you can transfer the discovery process and all that, that's all transferable, you know, at motions for summary judgment, you're just going to have to learn the different types of cases and rules and things like that in that particular um, type of practice. So there are a lot of similarities and a lot of patterns in law. So just highlight those. And, you, you know, like you said, sometimes it's like a forgotten skill. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I do know how to do that. Oh, yeah, that's true. I did know I did that for like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And another point to add in is, um, Let's see, I might have just had a uh, had the thought escape me. It'll come back up if it's important enough. <laughs> yeah, I always like to say that. Um, we'll see if it's important enough. It'll come back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, Andrew, um, did you have any other last uh, thoughts that you wanted to share with us before we end our awesome session? Yeah, when it comes to interviews, just a couple, uh, a couple points that we can touch on um, briefly, but that can be a difference maker for your listeners. One of the first questions that a firm will ask a candidate, and this extends to all types of interviews, not just within the legal profession, is tell me about yourself. And a lot of times, mm. by achieving and as effective as candidates are and have been, and the success they've created for themselves, they find themselves stuck on that question. How do I answer it? How far back do I go? What am I supposed to touch on? <laughs> so this is often a question we get quite a bit. And we, uh, we always walk our candidates through a comprehensive interview prep. So they're well prepared for, um, for the actual interview when the time comes. Wow, I love that. Yeah, so some of the pointers we share with, uh, with candidates regarding how to answer this question. Tell me about yourself. This is your prime opportunity to share about yourself personally. Again, in a concise and effective manner, but to showcase who you are. Because a lot of, and here's the point I, I had forgotten earlier, um, your narrative, who you are as a person and what you bring to that team besides just your hard skills, that is also a difference maker. Remember, this team you're, you're looking to join and once more this extends beyond legal, they're looking for people they're going to enjoy being around that have some personality outside of just the work that they're going to produce. Um, so being able to be present, actually listen to the conversations, not just sound like an automated answer machine. <laughs> Robot. What, yeah, right. This is what they're looking for. So again, with a question like, tell me about yourself. We often share, you know, start with where you grew up. You can often share in a very concise way what inspired you to go to law school. Mm. And I did the firm or whatever role you're currently at. And add in there what you're passionate about, um, what your current role consists of. So it's typically kind of where you grew up, how you got to law school, where you went to law school, and where you are now, and what you take care of. Yes. That's to tell me about yourself. I use this, this phrase a lot, and I know I've, 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 um, I've dropped it a, a couple times during our conversation thus far, but being concise. Remember, these firms are looking for attorneys that can be concise, that are effective communicators. So what I often see is associates are so 
eager to share and stuff all they can into an answer, unfortunately, they talk themselves out of an opportunity. Mm. Once again, being present and recognizing what question is being asked, hearing what question is being asked, and understanding you don't have to fit an entire interview's worth of information into a single answer. There are going to be subsequent questions that we can dive into with that. Yeah, so. treat it like a like a draft, <laughs> like a complaint, you know? Absolutely. Um, then we're going to talk yeah. about legal. <laughs> yeah, and one more question that, um, that I wanted to uh, discuss is, you know, share a challenge you've hit in your career or in your life and how you overcame it. And it can also be asked, tell me some strengths and weaknesses. And once again, for an attorney that's been doing very well um, through their professional career, they had great grades, they went to law school, it can often be difficult to choose something to share with an individual across the table that um, to answer the question and continue to paint yourself in a, in a great light. So all that to say, this is another question that seems to stump candidates. Mm. We share is you wanna pick something that where you're going to be vulnerable, but you can also share the information in a way that's highly effective to where you share the challenge and then you quickly pivot to how you handled that challenge and overcame it. Mm -hmm. Or same thing with the weakness. You're going to share a weakness that's genuine and honest, but you're going to quickly pivot to how you've taken steps, you've taken actions to overcome that. And that's just um, a formula for how to answer those kinds of questions. So instead of stressing out on, oh, I don't, I don't want to share anything that's going to be too revealing or that's immediately going to cut me from the role, use discernment, but also understand it's all in the way you share that experience or share that quality. Yeah, communication is key at any point, right? That's really what we are. We, um, one of the professors at Broward College uses the, uh, this phrase and, and it sticks with me. We are wordsmiths. Um, and that's what we do. That's really what legal professionals are known for is, is communicating, right. whether it's through written letters or, you know, verbal. And sometimes that doesn't translate. We get so stuck in the rules and procedures and formulas and what we need to do that we forget, hey, you know, simple communication can go a long way. Um, and the same formulas that we're using while we're drafting and while we're researching, we can utilize, you know, throughout the rest of our um, hobbies and life in general. Well, it was a pleasure having you on, Andrew. Um, thank you for these wonderful tips. I'm sure everybody's going to be writing it down or listening to this podcast over and over again because it has been the most requested. Um, so I appreciate you taking your time from your busy schedule and providing us all this useful information. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ada. My pleasure. Hey, Andrew. So you wanted to talk a little bit more about general transition, right? How to transition from different law firms and practices. So let give me some of that. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm a legal recruiter. And most individuals, most professionals are familiar with recruiting as it relates to different industries. But when it's time for you to make a move from one law firm to another, from a law firm to an in-house role, to a government position, whatever the case may be, there's no class on that in law school. And so oftentimes the conversations I have with candidates is how does this whole process work? So taking a step back, I work for a, a team where our name is Palmer Kent Associates. Our niche is big law, big law, uh, AMLAW 100, extends to AMLAW 200 and some boutiques and mid-sized firms in between and past that. And oftentimes, once a, an attorney, once an associate in this case of what I'm sharing, uh, decides to make a move, they can choose to use and work with a recruiter like myself. Some things you want to keep in mind. Different recruiters specialize in different things. Some recruiters specialize in a particular practice area, litigation, civil litigation, IP, um, trusts and estates, corporate work. Other recruiters specialize by level of law firm. As I shared, my team and I focus on big law. There are, there are recruiters that are specific geographically to South Florida, for example, to the East Coast, for example, to the major metro markets like New York, uh, Washington, DC, Boston, Chicago, et cetera. So choosing a recruiter that's gonna know uh, some of the nuances of your practice area and be able to provide great value to what you wanna do in terms of a transition that's what you as an attorney need to be looking out for, listening out for, and of course, feeling 
if that relationship, that conversation you're having with the recruiter is going to be right for you and the best value for the search that you want to take on. Um, some of the materials you want to have ready when you make a move, resume for sure. You want to update that. You want to work with a recruiter that can provide great suggestions and encourage um, guidance in terms of how to position the resume for what role you want to take on. You also want to have your transcripts. A lot of these firms request official transcripts, which you'll have to reach out to your, your uh, law school to receive. If you're a litigation attorney, you want to have some writing samples ready to go. Uh, there are different guidelines and how-tos on how to pick a writing sample, a lot of which are available online. But that's something as a litigator specifically, you're going to want to have ready. As a transactional lawyer, a deal sheet is a very important piece of how to showcase your work. When it comes to resumes, understand you don't want to include every single transaction you've worked on. If you're a corporate attorney or if you've done some uh, transactional work, then you're just going to have an overbloated resume. It's going to take up too many pages. No one's going to be able to decipher all the different points. So a deal sheet, which is a separate document, that's where you can highlight all the different deals you've worked on, the roles you've had in those, and be able to highlight the experience you bring to the table. Um, in addition to that, cover letters uh, we've spoken on a bit. Um, typically, at least in my experience, I'm communicating directly with a firm. So a cover letter, while encouraged, is not always necessary. We often share what a cover letter is going to entail with the firm directly. But these are some things that you want to just consider to have ready. And, um, and again, in, in speaking with the recruiter, make sure they're going to be a good fit for specifically the role that you want to take on. Um, you really How do you suggest, um, well, because I just popped up on my questions here. Um, how do you suggest someone choose a recruiter? Like, how can they go about in a respectful manner of choosing a recruiter or just being honest from the forefront? Hey, listen, this is really what I'm looking for. Is this something that you can truly help me with? It's a great question to start. Um, it's, it's giving the, the recruiter, whoever they are, the opportunity to showcase what experience they have in the space. Um, again, whether they specifically service the type of um, work or the type of firm that you're going for. Like I said, for us, as an example, we typically deal with those, uh, those larger law firms. If there's an attorney out there who doesn't so much see themselves in the big law world, but they see themselves in a, uh, a boutique, say again, in Miami, since it's right to the South, um, there are certain recruiters that know Miami inside and out, have those relationships. Sometimes it's us, but sometimes it's not. So you got to look for the, the, the honesty that comes from a recruiter, in my experience, um, having the integrity to tell a, a candidate, hey, it seems like you have great background, but we're not going to be the most valuable for your search. And so listening for that type of honesty, that type of integrity, not just a recruiter who, who's boasting about the world, boasting about the fact that they can absolutely do it, over-promise, under-deliver. Um, it's all in the questions you can, you can ask. And so leading off with, um, the question you, uh, you posed is a great way to do it. Seeing their experience on a LinkedIn, checking out their website, seeing what type of work they do, um, whether it's specific to a city, a practice area, et cetera. Those are all things you can do at the outset. Then go into the conversation with, all right, let's, let's, talk, uh, let's talk turkey, so to speak. Right. So doing your research is most likely is, is really the best way to do it, um, especially if you're looking for something super specific. Um, how about if you have no clue? You just want to kind of just transition to something else and um, are really looking for something different. You're kind of tired of where you're at and, and you, you just want to go somewhere else to see if maybe it's just that type of practice that, you know, is just not a fit for you or um, is it just the legal industry in general? So any suggestions on that? Sure. So that's a great way to find out if a, uh, if a recruiter knows what they're talking about, because we often ask funding boards for our candidates. Um, we're going to listen. We're going to provide great guidance based on short-term and long-term goals. If you're working with a recruiter that's not even asking you about where you see yourself in three, five years down the line, um, unfortunately, you're boxing yourself into a short-term placement that may not be beneficial to your career. And so we're recruiters that have that in mind and that you can feel care about you in the long term. Mm -hmm. That's how you're working with a recruiter that's going to be a great fit. Um, remind me the question one more time. I can often ramble. I, I want to make the point. 
Um, how about if the person seeking to transition doesn't really know where to transition? They're just trying to get out of their normal rut. You know, they're just in a rut right now and they just don't know what they want to do. Understood. So a good recruiter is going to have enough knowledge to guide you through great questions and being able to support you to define your wants and needs um, based on their experience, plus based on what they know about the, uh, the legal landscape. It's all in them being able to guide you to provide some clarity. Now, it takes a part on the candidate to be able to make decisions for their career and be able to be clear. So when they're sitting across the table in an interview setting, they're not coming across as ambivalent. You really want to, in that con uh, conversation with the recruiter, make sure you're touching on all the pieces. And so if you're unclear, that recruiter, a good one, is going to be able to provide some clarity and some guidance based on the questions they ask, based on sharing about um, different law practices. So we can often be a sounding board for candidates. That's another one of the value adds we provide. A lot of attorneys I speak to, they're not looking to make a move right at the moment, but having a conversation about what the market looks like, what some firms in the space that the work they want to do, that is also incredibly valuable. So it's not always just like giving value on your resume. It's being able to talk about the market as a whole. It's being able to talk about where we believe you're strongest in terms of making a move, where we don't believe you have as great a chance. And being direct about that, being honest about that, serves candidates just as well as sharing what, they, um, what they're going to be well suited for. Yeah, so it sounds like um, using or utilizing a service of a legal recruiter is not only to be utilized at the time that you're trying to transition, maybe it's also at the time you're preparing, right? So maybe this might not be an immediate change or transition that you want, are looking for, but maybe within, I don't know, two to three years or maybe even five years, depending on your lifestyle. Of course, um, I know, especially as females, they love to plan ahead, you know, come time for marriage and children, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so maybe this is a service that they can utilize, you know, during tra certain transitions in their life as well, right? Correct. Once the process starts, um, you become very close knit with these recruiters that you're working with. I get to know my candidates very well. We're talking at nights. We're talking on weekends. We're texting each other quite a bit in terms of what opportunities are coming up. Mm. So... You don't need to wait until you've made the decision. You can start, here's a, a great suggestion. Look on LinkedIn, do a, do a quick search or just check your inboxes because I'm sure with the market as it is, you're getting quite a bit of emails about um, recruiters wanting to work with you. Um, mm -hmm. This is a great time to forge some relationships. Don't just pass it off as, hey, I'm not in the market right now. Thanks, but no thanks. Connect on LinkedIn, um, share what part of your practice is, share what you keep an eye out for in a couple of years or what your short-term or long-term goals are. So that recruiter can keep you in mind and you start that relationship well before it's actually time. So when the time does come, you guys are already like this and they're going to know you, um, you and your professional um, aspirations pretty well. And How service. about um, for the law firms that are looking to staff their, their, you know, their law firm? Um, any suggestions? I'm assuming legal recruiters you know, are useful for that as well, right? Absolutely. So oftentimes um, we are working for the law firms, uh, so to speak. They're the ones who pay the placement fee. One more point about working with a legal recruiter is uh, I always use the analogy similar to a, uh, a realtor. You're not paying, a candidate is not paying us for our service. Once we make a placement, a successful placement, it's a law firm that uh, pays a placement fee based on a first year salary. So don't think as an associate, um, as an attorney, that you need to come up with a bunch of cash to, uh, to utilize our service. That's not the case. On the flip side, law firms are very hungry for talent, um, especially right now at the current market, they are very hungry for talent. Do they have all the resources to source candidates on their own? Not all the time. So that's where working with a recruiter can be very beneficial to a law firm just as much as to a candidate. And so um, as recruiters, uh, I, I can speak from experience of my team, we're always talking with both candidates as well as law firms, both in South Florida and nationwide as to what their strategic growth plans are, what their needs are. We're talking to, to um, managing partners, we're talking to chairs, we're talking to hiring partners on what they see uh, taking place with um, their practice areas, their firms, the needs they have. And so working with a recruiter that has those connections that can speak as to what the needs are in the marketplace and specifically for the practice area, that is again how you can determine if you have the right fit in terms of a, uh, a recruiter for your search.
I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's great. I actually wrote down a whole page of notes while you were talking. So thank you for that. Um, because it's useful, you know, all the tips that you gave not only is specific to associates, it's also specific, you know, for any legal staff member um, is very general because now paralegals are also specializing and getting masters and, and really getting up to par with um, lawyers so that they can assist in the strategy and the caseload management. So yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for those tips. Yeah, you're very welcome.